Uh, today, we're picking up with the questions you didn't think you could ask in church. And here's the question this week. Every uh, week in August, every Sunday, we're going to take a look at your top four questions. And this made the list. Why are we Baptists? What is, what is the, what's up with being Baptist? There, there's some controversy this year about the, the Southern Baptist Convention. It'd probably have had better years. And so here, I've just kind of grouped all of your questions into three categories because they all fit. What is a Baptist? Uh, why is our church staying with the Southern Baptist Convention? I got that a lot. Why is baptism so important? So we'll look at these. We'll address uh, all of these uh, issues. And we're going to do it through Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 43. Now, let me ask a question real quick before we get into the text. How many of you were born Baptist and you are still Baptist? Show of hands. Born Baptist, still Baptist. You made it back from Anderson Grove already. Good job. The song was beautiful today. I'm sorry, but try again. Born Baptist. Born ba Oh, yeah, okay. All right. How many of you are convinced Baptist? It wasn't Baptist, but I, I am now. I mean, you've convinced Baptist. Okay, all right. How many did not even know you were at a Baptist church today? <laughs> did not even know. We've had some hands go up on that. All right, so we're going to talk about why we are Baptist, and then we're, we'll deal with the Southern Baptist Convention issue. But, but how many, let me ask, how many people have, have never been Baptist before? Never been Baptist. So, wow, okay, all right. Well, good, I'm, you're here at a great day. Because today, the deacons are going to come out. We have snakes ready for our snake handling Sunday. And you'll, no, just take one and pass it down. Now let's do stand, all right? We'll honor the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 43. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them all to the extent that anyone had need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth and our time together to look at and learn from your word. I pray that we would in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The text I read, anytime I have a church issue or something comes up, how can you do church better or how can the church respond to certain things, I always go back to Acts chapter 2. When starting the Lee Park Church family, we went back to Acts chapter 2. This is not a denominational thing in Acts chapter 2. These are the first steps of the first church. And if I want some advice or information about the church, I want to go back to the church in its newest purest form. I want to be a part of that church. That's the kind of church I want to go to. That's the kind of church I want to pastor. That's the spirit of the church, the model of the church, the goal of the church, the heart of the church. No label, no anything like that. Just people who are in awe of what God has done. People who decide to gather together and share with one another as others would have need. Those who want to gather together and break bread together and love one another and take their meals together and worship Christ together. It's such a pure, honest gathering of people whose lives have been changed that the Lord God would see fit to bless their number every day by day by day. That's a church I want to go to. I grew up Methodist, and then for a while we went to a, a home church that would best be described as Pentecostal, then back to the Methodist church. Then there's this girl, Becky, that, man, she was so pretty. I ended up marrying her, but before we got married, she was Nazarene, so I became Nazarene so I could go be with her. We got Nazarene in the house. Hey, hey. Oh, of course, Amy's here. That's right. Good. <laughs> Amy is here. So we were, I was Nazarene for a bit. And then we got married. We moved to West Virginia for a year and a half. We went to a Nazarene church. They got in a fight in the middle of the service. Uh, you know, sorry, Amy. But there was a business meeting going wrong. And so we thought, well, we're not that. And then we went to a little church there, but I didn't really know that much about it. We moved to North, Newburn, North Carolina. We tried a few churches. I went to Tabernacle Baptist Church in Newburn, North Carolina and loved it. Loved it. Still did not have, I didn't know, but they were Southern Baptists. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what Southern Baptist was. I, they could have been Methodist for all I knew. They just didn't do the doxology at the end of all the services. 
And then we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina and went to Hickory Grove Baptist Church. And whoa, never seen anything like that before. Big place, great music. And Dr. Joe B. Brown was just preaching. It's like, wow. My friend Clint Presley, then he would preach on like Wednesday nights and early Sunday morning. And I, I hadn't really experienced expository preaching before. And wow. And I want to be a part of that church. And they were Southern Baptists. I had no idea what it meant. And now here I am, Southern Baptist pastor. Well, why? Well, let's take a look. First, I want you to see our connection with the Baptist church. In 1925, Oakview Baptist Church started. In 1954, the name changed to Lee Park Baptist Church. We are 97 years old. I don't know the specifics about that uh, first church at Oakview. I don't know the specifics about when in 1925, Lee Park, uh, or 1925, Oakview came. I don't know the specifics about Lee Park in 1954. What I do know this is there are some things about that church that I can know because in 1925, there was this thing that came out called the Baptist Faith and Message. The same year, Oakview Baptist Church started. It was updated in the 60s. It was updated again in 2000. If you'd like to know more about what a Baptist is, in your bulletin, there's a link to the Baptist Faith and Message. It shows who we are. It shows what we're about. It's a document that I like. It's a document I agree with. It's a document we try to practice and, and keep in line with because it's biblically based. And so I like it. But let me give you the seven basics of a Southern Baptist church. Again, there are lots of Baptist flavors out there. There's Free Will Baptist, there's Independent Baptist, there's Primitive Baptist, there's Missionary Baptist, there is Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, there's just Baptist Baptist, there's Southern Baptist, and because we thought we needed another name, we also now call ourselves Great Commission Baptist. So there's lots of flavors of Baptist. We are Southern Baptist. Here's one of our um, basics. We're people of the book. You see the Baptist logo, it's a cross in the Bible. We, we are not... The uh, Catholics would have tradition and scripture. Orthodox would have tradition and scripture. Protestants have scripture. We're Protestants. We're protesters. That's what Protestant means. We protested against the idea that you wouldn't use God's word. And the Baptists are the Protestants of the Protestants. We are committed to the book. So much so that in our earlier days, other Protestants were killing us. We are people of the book. We're going to stick to the book. The disciples had evidence through sight. They saw Jesus. We have evidence through the word. He speaks to us through the word. And we are guided by this book. Why am I a Baptist? I am a Biblicist more than I'm anything else. And if the Baptists are people of the book, I am too. We're evangelical. That sometimes gets a bad rap. Evangelical means that we believe Jesus is God. We believe Jesus is God's son. We believe that the Bible is God's word. And we believe the Great Commission is true and that we should share Christ with other people. We believe salvation by grace through faith. We as Protestants in the Great Reformation, we are a part of the solas, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, by the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. And so we believe that salvation is a free gift offered by God that we claim by faith. We believe in the priesthood of believers. You don't have to go to somebody else to go to Jesus. You don't have to come to me to go to Jesus. You don't have to have a time of confessional with me before you go to Jesus. You can go straight to Jesus. And in fact, I would love it that more of you did that. Go straight to Jesus. <laughs> you just go right to him. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that out loud. We also believe in believer's baptism. We'll talk more specifically about that in just a minute, but it's a choice by someone who desires to make an outward show of an inward change in their life. We also have this, and I'll close with this. There are many more than seven, but here's what really separates us from other denominations. It's congregational polity. We are the original non-denominational church, and here's why. We work together, but we're a convention. We're not a denomination. We work together with other Southern Baptist churches locally. We work together with other Southern Baptist churches in the state and around the world. And congregational polity is what keeps us together. Meaning this, you vote. When, when I see the book of Acts and I say, I want to go to that church, there's nothing that stops us from being that church. 
There's no denominational hierarchy that tells me what to preach. There's no denominational, denominational hierarchy that we have to follow along their pattern. We decide. It is one of the great freedoms of the Baptist church, and it is one of the great weaknesses of the Baptist church. Those of you who raised your hand, you've been Baptist your whole life, you know how weak congregational polity can be. You know that congregational polity brings power struggles because the people vote and the people make the decisions and the people move forward and it's about the pastor and the people working together and you've been in those Baptist churches where they're not working together. You've been in those Baptist churches where it's ugly. You've been in those Baptist churches where there are 50 people and 50 committees. You've been in those Baptist churches where the committees drive everything. It's about a power struggle. You've been in those Baptist churches where a family has the control and the family determines what the church is going to do and the family determines who the pastor is going to be. And for all the jokes about the Methodist church changing pastors every three years, the average lifespan of a Baptist pastor is also three years. But they don't get moved to another Methodist church. Normally they get fired by congregational polity. Or they get fed up and they leave because of congregational polity. It ends up causing church splits. It is a great blight against the Baptist church that we who gather together in this Acts chapter 2 model that we love one another end up not working well together because of congregational polity and yet part of the reason I'm Baptist congregational polity I want you to be a part of the process I don't want someone else to tell us what to do I want to do it and I don't want anything to slow us down I want us to go 16 and a half years ago there were 15 or 50 people at Lee Park Baptist Church and a new pastor who didn't really know what he was doing yet and we all got together and we decided to try we decided to just try. We decided we were going to gather around one phrase, preach the word and love people. And I told him, when I come up with a smarter one and a better one, we'll change to that. And we never have. Preaching the Bible and loving people worked for us. It works for us today. There is not a fight. There's not going to be a fight. The congregational polity is not going to strangle us. We don't have 50 committees. We have two. We don't have business meetings all the time because of COVID. I don't know if we've had one in two years, but we're going to have one in September. And I would invite you to come and watch our congregational polity work. We will not fight. And I want to be a part of that church. I, want to, I don't care what you call it. I don't care what's the, on the side of the wall. I want to be a part of that church where they actually do preach the word and love people. And we're in a setup where then you can be a part of deciding how we move and how we go. And I think that is great. What changed? How, how does this happen? What causes a church to be able to work together? Well, in, in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, men of Israel, Peter says. Now, by the way, this is Peter preaching. We're taking a step out of the book of Mark, and, and, and we'll get back to it next month. Remember Peter? What is the, the problem Peter always has? He doesn't like the idea that Jesus is going to die. When Jesus said that he was going to die, Peter rebuked him. At the Mount of Transfiguration, when he saw the Transfiguration, the glory of God through the Son of God, what was Peter's issue then? Well, I really don't want you to die. I'll build a tabernacle for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I don't want you to die. And, and then even at the time when, when Christ is, we haven't got there in Mark yet, but in the time when they've got, they're ready to take Christ and, and the, 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 the crucifixion is, sentence is about to be handed down, Peter is so distraught. They say, aren't you one of his followers? I don't, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Why are you going to die? Now look at Peter. After the resurrection of Christ, here's the first preached message from Peter. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Now, that's just part of his sermon in Acts chapter 2. I would encourage you to go read it. This is a different man after seeing a resurrected Christ. This is a different Peter, different preacher, different apostle, different person. He has been changed by Christ. What do the people do? In verse 37, they're pierced to the heart. And they said to, the, to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, what do we do? Look what Peter says. I want to be this kind of church. 
that when people are pierced to the heart, they don't know what to do. When they're pierced to the heart and they're afraid, when they're pierced to the heart and they're convicted, when they're pierced to the heart and they want their lives to change, I want to have an answer to that question, what do we do? Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You're repenting for the forgiveness of your sins, that you would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They immediately started gathering. In chapter 5, they're called the church. In chapter 8, they're persecuted. In chapter 9, they take off. This church takes off on this gospel message that throughout the book of Mark, we kept seeing Jesus say, don't say it yet. Don't tell them yet. Don't tell them yet. Why? Why wouldn't I tell them yet? Because the fullness has to be there. Now, here's the fullness. Christ came and did miraculous things. And on our behalf, he lived perfectly so that in his sacrificial death, we might come to God, be reconciled to God through Christ in his perfect sacrifice on the cross. So we, we had a moment in our lives where we said, what do I do? And then by God's grace, we had something to do. Repent and come to him. Tell him you're sorry. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to change your life and save your life and make you new. I want to be a part of that kind of church. And being Baptist doesn't keep me from being that kind of church. That's why I'm Baptist. Second thing we see is our continuation in the Southern Baptist Convention. Do we stay in or do we get out? This is quite a conversation these days. Some of our churches around us are seriously discussing leaving the Southern Baptist Convention. They say the convention is now too woke and they, the, the scandal that happened with the sex abuse is just sort of a, one of their reasons to now get out. Do we get out? Um, well, the, the sex abuse scandal was, was bad. It was, and, but they fixed it, praise God. I, the things I voted for when I was there, I think, are certainly the step in the right direction. The things that we've done as a church, have, have, we're ahead of the curve, which I think is, is also good. The lack of transparency is an issue. We're trying to fix that. Uh, there is an abundance of procedural roadblocks. This is what happens when you get congregational polity. You create a bunch of rules, and rules just slow things down. And then suddenly you're not, a, you're not non-denominational anymore. Now you are just constricted by bylaws. You might say, preacher, do you have bylaws here? Yes, I have no idea what they say. I don't, re I don't read them, haven't read them. I'm sure they're very good and very Baptist. And, but I'm not going to let them bog us down. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, and if you want to get them, I don't know how you can get them. Ask Pastor Kit. Ask Judy, go to the information desk and say, can I see the bylaws? And she'll probably say, I'm not even really sure where they are, but I'm sure they're here somewhere. But we are not going to let these things bog us down and, and then rule over us. We're going to do what we do. Okay, anyway, are we going to leave the Southern Baptist Convention? I have no plans on leaving the Southern Baptist Convention. And here's why, the cooperative program. When 50,000 churches can come together and raise $1.1 billion to help our missionaries around the world, I don't want to leave that. When our state association can raise $28 million to help churches, I don't want to leave that. I don't want to get away from something in a time when churches are collapsing all around us, when pastors are leaving all around us, when churches are hurting all around us. is not the time, I don't believe, to get away from the cooperative program, which is the best thing going in churches today. Our help for one another, our sharing with one another. And, and within that framework, they allow us the freedom as Lee Park to do what we want to do. We don't have to help every Southern Baptist cause. We don't. Some of them we don't think are effective, so we don't help them. And we're free not to and stay Southern Baptist. But there are other things we think are really effective, like the Lee Park Church family. You'll spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars every year helping other churches. And I think that's right. It's the cooperative nature of who we are as Baptists. You've got, they've got nine churches here in America and about 18 churches outside of America. And we are, we are cooperating with them and supporting them. And I think that's a good thing. What is this? This is the church of Acts. They're all inspired of what Jesus has done. We've come together in a common faith. We're sharing and meeting needs. We're living and worshiping in community. And we believe that is why we have been blessed by the Lord. And that's why I'm Baptist, because I want to go to a church like that. Here's the third thing, and I'll be finished. Our conviction in baptism by immersion. Okay, so never joined a church before. I guess I was sort of counted on the registry once in the Methodist church. I was uh, uh, sprinkled and, and moved into the Methodist registry that way. But when I joined Hickory Grove, they, I came down front and they said, all right, have you been baptized? I said, no, but I would love to. 
And Becky was the same way. She said, I would love to, so we got baptized. I didn't know it was a requirement. I didn't know you have to, had to be. And so I've had people say to me since, well, you, you, you were Methodist. What did you say when they said that you had to be baptized? I said, they never got to that. When they mentioned baptism, I said, I want it. That's what you guys do. I want that. Plus, I want to be baptized. And, they, and I know what you're saying, well, you were baptized as Methodist. Well, I was sprinkled, and it meant a lot to my parents, and I honor my parents. I didn't have anything to do with that decision, but I honor the Methodist church for that's the way they operate. Some people call it a baptism. Okay, I, I don't see it as that way. I see biblical baptism as a decision you make. That not someone makes it for you. I see biblical baptism as a decision you make. I see biblical baptism as your way to publicly show your separation from the world. I see biblical baptism as a sign of obedience, that Christ called you to be baptized, and you're baptized because you're obedient to Christ. Once you've been saved by Christ, you're obedient to Christ, and you follow in baptism. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples of all the nations baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Show your union with Christ by publicly being baptized. Can I be a member and not get baptized? No. That's elitist. It sounds legalistic. Well, I didn't complain in the Methodist church because I was four months old. I didn't have a choice, but that's part of the deal in the Baptist church, I have a choice, and I want to be a part of a church where people say I'm separating from the world to join together with the body of Christ, and I will publicly stand in a baptistry, and I will say that I, by faith, have trusted Christ. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior publicly? Yes. Will you follow him all the days of your life? You publicly say yes. Because of your willingness to follow Christ in believer's baptism, I baptize you, my brother and sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. But what about going all the way under? What about going all the way under? That seems a little legalistic. Biblically, it's the best definition. Biblically, it's the best example. The, the word actually speaks to going under and the model that we have from Christ actually shows to going under. Yeah, but what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, let me take me, I'll, I have made exceptions. Because I had a young man who could not physically go back into the water. His body was in such condition that all he could do was lean forward and his face touch the water. Well, did he go all the way under? No. Was he baptized? I believe he was. He publicly stood, and as best he was able to verbalize in his condition, that he loved Christ, and he publicly stood for Christ, publicly announced that he would follow Christ all the days of his life, and he leaned forward and touched the water as much as he could. And so I say that's baptism. Now, I have been a part of churches where there was one where a guy was getting baptized and he was afraid of the water and he got scared and he grabbed the pastor's arm as the pastor was trying to put him in and he only got baptized to hear. And the church said, it doesn't count. I don't want to be a part of that church. I had a story, I was in the baptistry one time, I had a little boy, when he got in there, he got scared. And he wanted to announce publicly he was following Christ, but he was scared. And so he said, would you go in with me? And I said, absolutely, buddy. And so we both got dunked. I dunked him and dunked me. I've been baptized three times, take that. <laughs> <laughs> so I made exceptions for that. I recognize physical limitations or things that this overriding sense of fear that we can work around that is that public uh, separation from the world and union with Christ that I want. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Here's, here's, here's what I get down to, and I'll close on this. I, I want you to be able to say this. I want to be a part of that church. When I look at the book of Acts, I want to be a part of that church. And I, I want our church to be that. 
I want us to continue to help other churches. I want us to continue to love one another and gather together and, and use the resources that God has blessed us with to share it with other people. And, and, I, and I'm counting on God to continue to bless us day by day by day as we're faithful with the things that he's given us. And I, I want to love each other. I want to come on Sunday. I want to open this book. I want to read the book. I want to explain the book. I want to draw you to a personal relationship with Christ as the Holy Spirit does that drawing. I want to open up the word so you would see how much he loves you. And I want you by faith to come to Christ. And I want you by faith to grow in this church. And I want you to be able to say, I want to be a part of this church, not just attend. I want to be a part of this church because I believe in what we're doing. And I want you to bring your babies up here and, and we dedicate your babies to the Lord. I want you to see your families grow up here. I want to see you get old here. I want to get old here. But thankfully, Tom Rayner says that if you haven't been fired in the first three years or four years, you're probably not going to get fired. And once you get over 11 years, you're probably going to stick it out. The only question is, after that 11th year, do you still have as much passion? Because the, the idea would be that pastors realize then, I can kind of coast. I hope you see in the guy who's the pastor here, I have as much passion. I want to be this kind of church. And I believe I'm a part of a, a, of a convention that allows us to be this kind of church. And there's nothing stopping us. God wants his son to receive praise and honor and glory. God wants his churches to be pure and holy and spotless and without wrinkle. And God wants us to serve him through this local body of the church. I want to be a part of that church. Stand with me and let's close in a word of prayer. By the way, this, it comes, this came up as one of the questions I got. Why don't you call yourself Lee Park Baptist Church? If you're Baptist, why don't you call yourself Lee Park Baptist? Well, here's what happened. We made stickers when I first got here. I wanted us to start driving around town with stickers. And the sticker said, Lee Park Baptist Church. And the Baptist was in cursive, and we had to make it smaller so it would fit on our sticker. And I didn't think it looked good, so we took it off. I said, let's make it look bigger. Big red cross, big Lee Park. They see the cross. They know it's Christian. They see Lee Park. They can Google it. It's Lee Park. They'll find out they're Baptist when they come. <laughs> so I'm not ashamed of being a Baptist. We just don't talk about it. <laughs> But I'd love to tell you there was some big dramatic, it was, it was a marketing thing. We just wanted the, the name and no one really knew where, what Lee Park was and we, we wanted to get the name out there. So that's why it was. And then and I've, I've had this before too. Do you Baptists think you're the only ones going to be in heaven? <laughs> and I say, no, we're not going to be the only people in heaven, but we're going to be first in line. Especially if there's food. That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's right. When are the Baptists going to come? Well, they're still at the buffet. Well, all right. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you. We're not a perfect church. And the Baptist convention is not a perfect convention. And there are people who are rightly upset and disappointed with so many things that have happened. And there may be some who, who get away. But God, I'm thankful for the freedom that allows us to try to be the kind of church you would have us be. We're not, we're not constrained by any, anything in this convention. What, what holds people back is lack of faith. What holds people back is pride. What holds churches back, congregational polity gone wrong. God, don't ever let us slip into that trap. Convict us, correct us, do whatever it takes that we don't fall into that trap. God, more than anything, we want to be the kind of church where people can stand. And like Peter said, Jesus Christ lived perfectly. He's, his death was sacrificial. His resurrection shows his deity. And now the offer of grace comes. What will you do with it? Here's the offer of grace. You can be forgiven today. What do you do? Repent. Ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to help you and change you and make you new. Come to him by faith 
and then boldly separate from the world in communion with him, with the body of believers, and be obedient, follow in baptism. Because he asked for it. Help us as we make these decisions about being that kind of church that others would say, I want to be in that kind of church. We want to do these things and make sure that you get the praise and honor and glory that's due only you as we pray to you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.